Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be presenting to you today. Thank you, Sheila, for the generous and very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, President Corbetta and our panelists for taking time out of your busy schedules to be part of this webinar. Today, I'm going to present our take on the macro prospects of the Philippines this year, 2023. And since last year marked a change in political leadership, we are also presenting what we believe ought to be some of the policy priorities of the new government. So throwing in our two cents worth on that as well. My co-authors, again, are John Paul Corpus and Ramona Maria Miral. Um, so can we have the slide on, please? Can, I, um, can we see the slide? Um, I'm sorry, I cannot see the slide. Okay. Okay. So again, this is uh, um, the first, uh, actually the first chapter of the PIDS Economic Policy Monitor, which is one of the flagship publications of the P of PIDS. The theme this year being hashtag close the gap, accelerate post pandemic recovery through social justice. So before I present, I would just like to state the usual disclaimer. For the forecasts and analysis that we are presenting, these are ultimately the opinions of myself and my co-authors, assuming they agree with me, of course, and not necessarily of PIDs as a whole. So let me show you first uh, the presentation outline. Um, next slide, please. So first, we will be discussing the macro performance of the Philippines in uh, the past couple of years, 21, 2021, and 2022. Then we'll look at the macro conditions going into 2023, the new year. Then we will look at the macro outlook for this year and followed by a discussion of the limiting factors, the risks and challenges faced by the economy. And finally, our own take on what should be done or what can be done uh, in steering through these global headwinds that we will also discuss in, during the presentation. Next slide, please. So first part, uh, what was the macro performance in 21, 22? So we know exactly what happened now. Um, so we know that in 2020, we had a, a deep recession. So if you look at the first graph, that's uh, the red bar uh, because of the pandemic. And we have been recovering since then. Um, we grew by 5.7% in 2021 and uh, a stronger than expected uh, growth of 7.6% in 2022, thanks um, to the lifting of pandemic restrictions and the rise in vaccinations and the revival thereof of public mobility. So on the spending side, we know that the resurgence was seen in the largest component of aggregate demand, which is household consumption, accounting for about 70%. So that's the yellow bar in the middle graph. So we see a resurgence in the yellow bar, which is consumption, and the resurgence in the orange bar, which is investment. On the production side, uh, the recovery was seen again in the most uh, badly hit sector, which was services. So that's the yellow bar. And support also coming from a revival in uh, industrial output, which is the gray bar. Next slide, please. Okay, so the reopening um, also um, featured uh, uh, a recovery in the employment sector. So the economic uh, reopening improved labor market conditions. So again, um, we saw um, the worst uh, during the pandemic. So we had uh, unemployment rising to as high as I think 17.6% and underemployment as high as 18.9% in, uh, in uh, April of 2020, and labor force participation rising to around, uh, sorry, falling to around 55.7% during the same period. But again, there we have seen a recovery there. Labor force participation has gone back um, to pre-pandemic uh, levels, at, uh, in fact, above pre-pandemic levels. And unemployment has also normalized, gone back to pre-pandemic levels. Although uh, underemployment uh, remains elevated, 
So we saw another surge in unemployment, underemployment, sorry, in July 2021. It has since come down and uh, still uh, uh, hovers around 14.2% in October of 2022. Next slide, please. So the biggest, uh, next slide, please. So the biggest story was really inflation. Okay, the, the past two years, the biggest story was inflation. So inflation uh, reached 3.9% uh, in 2021. That's uh, from the rebased uh, index. But uh, the, the initial print there was about 4.4%, which is above um, the target. And the inflation story then was uh, in 2021 was really dominated by food prices. So mainly higher meat prices due to the African swine, swine fever and higher energy prices as demand for energy rebounded globally from the pandemic. And the inflation story continued in 2022. Uh, again, we know the story there, there. Inflation began to climb due to uh, the Russian Ukraine, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. And that conflict led to geopolitical tensions, which led to higher, uh, contributed to higher energy prices and higher world food prices. Okay, so, that, so um, and then it continued. Uh, until today, uh, notably in the prices of, of vegetables and, um, and utilities. So the BSP uh, was able to maintain the policy rate at 2% uh, throughout 2021 and most of 2022, but it, uh, it eventually had to contain rising inflation. And so the policy rate was hiked seven times, actually from May 2022 to January 2023, by a total of 3.5 percentage points. So from 2% to 5.5%. So there was uh, monetary tightening. Um, next slide, please. The other major story of the year was uh, the, the currency story. So the Philippine peso weakened against the US dollar beginning mid uh, 2021 and until 2022. Uh, simultaneous to that, we saw the current account, uh, we saw it uh, go into a surplus, remember, in April, uh, in, sorry, in 2020, and mainly because imports were falling uh, faster than exports, so we had a surplus, and that has swung back to a deficit and continues to be in a def deficit. At the same time, um, the U.S. rate, were, uh, the U.S. policy rates were being hiked by the U.S. Uh, Fed uh, in their bid to fight inflation. And so the aggressive tightening of the Fed uh, led to a, a narrowing of the gap between um, local and uh, U.S. policy rates, so Philippine and U.S. policy rates. So that uh, is how it looked in 2021 and 2022. And so what are the macro conditions going forward? Next slide, please. So the macroeconomic conditions going into uh, 2023. Um, so there are uh, several major main threads. One is uh, a slowing of major economies. So um, there was uh, a revision, substantial uh, downward revision of growth forecasts for advanced economies, notably for US, Japan, and key countries in the euro area. The US last year posted two consecutive quarter on quarter GDP declines during the first half of 2022 with growth remaining weak until the year end. But there's a, there's a positive lining because the US labor market remains relatively tight. So there's relatively um, um, still um, some growth there. You can see some growth there. And then uh, in China, on the other hand, uh, they also fell to a historic low of 0.4% annually last year in Q2 2022, rebounded uh, three point, by 3.9% uh, by in Q3, but weakened again to Q4. So um, seems like, uh, you know, a very somber story, but uh, especially with the real uh, estate crisis uh, adding, to the negative outlook. But again, there's a positive uh, uh, shimmer of hope there because they have let go of their zero COVID uh, policy regime. And so that is expected to um, fuel optimism, okay? 
So in fact, in the markets, uh, markets lately have actually been very optimistic, with, especially with the pronouncements of the Fed uh, and uh, yeah, of, with, uh, with China's uh, abandonment of their zero COVID strategy. Next slide, please. So the other uh, major thread is um, still inflation, unfortunately. So inflation has become a major concern across countries leading to monetary tightening globally. So if you look at the first graph, you can see that uh, the story that we told earlier uh, is there. We have a surge in global oil and food prices, especially following the Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, beginning February last year. But this uh, peaked in Q2 2022 and actually, uh, the good news is it actually has been softening. So global oil and food prices have been slowing down. Okay, so um, that being said, higher food and energy prices uh, are still seen all over the world. The aggregate demand is stoking inflation across the world. So there are countries where um, inflation remains to be high and where central banks are therefore responding by hiking interest rates and uh, this basically uh, ends the, the period of easing monetary policy that prevailed since the start of the pandemic. The next slide, please. The other major thread that we see uh, that uh, we have our own financial conditions index. This is uh, a, 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 an index that I developed together with uh, Dr. Vishaka Bautista of the UP School of Economics. And uh, the the thing that we have to watch out for is that financial conditions in the country have actually worsened uh, already in line with tightening monetary policy and higher domestic currency risk. And it has gone into negative territory. Um, and the last reading was in mid-2022. And we know that there was further monetary tightening during the time and further um, currency volatility during the time. So likely gone down further. And so that is uh, sort of the warning sign that we should be looking at. However, um, this is uh, a world where, you know, a very uh, VUCA world, as they say. So there is also a, a positive uh, indicator that we see. So there's uh, the, uh, in terms of high frequency indicators, the PMI is also one indicator that's uh, sort of very useful. And we see PMIs actually going up uh, uh, in November, uh, as of November of 2022. So what does that mean? It means that there is, uh, this still suggests further economic ex expansion because this index considers variables such as business output, new orders and uh, exports and readings above 50 suggest expansion. And clearly we are above 50 and the PMI is rising. Okay, so two pictures that uh, seem to say uh, different, indicate different things. Okay, so next slide, please. Um, another um, um, thing, thread that we are uh, looking at, uh, another theme is really uh, the demand for loans have been growing. So that's a good sign, despite tightening of monetary policy. If you look at the first graph, if you see it, the red line, there's a very sharply rising line, and that's really the line for household consumption loans. Okay, so household consumption, uh, borrowings for household consumption has been rising. If you look at the third graph to the right, um, that is especially true for salary loans and credit card loans. So yeah, you could look at positive, look at it possibly pos positively or negatively, but the thing is, it is rising, and it has been fueling household consumption. And the the question, of course, is is it going to continue? In terms of production uh, loans, um, there is growth, and especially in areas sectors of the economy where we expect to find it, which is information. Uh, and communication, given uh, uh, the need uh, for such during the pandemic, it also has been rising for manufacturing, which is also, again, an optimistic sign. Next slide, please. Uh, so this is just a flashback because this is what we usually looked at before during the pandemic. 
because the main restriction to growth there was really mobility restriction. So this is just to reiterate that mobility has recovered. Okay, the restrictions have been removed and we are slowly going back to not really going back, but at least uh, people are now going out in recreation and retail. If you look at the right uh, graph, right side graph, you can see that mobility has gone up for recreation and retail. Although people are still say, staying at home, um, we do see them now going out of their houses. Um, next slide, please. And finally, um, another sort of more subdued uh, thread is really that fiscal policy has become less expansionary. So that's what we're seeing based on the government's medium-term fiscal program. Spending is actually set to grow by less than 3% in 2023. And fiscal, and this is really part, I think, the DOF uh, representative will explain to us that, uh, maybe part of their consolidation already as they hope to bring the budget deficit from 8.6% of GDP in 2021 to 3% um, of GDP in 2028. Um, I think now it's around uh, minus 6.9% uh, of GDP. Uh, and so the fiscal consolidation story is starting to show and the hope is, uh, this is uh, supporting their hope to bring debt to GDP um, ratio, the debt to, debt to GDP ratio to below 60% by 2025 from the projected peak of 61.8% in 2022. So I think 22, uh, 2022, the figure for, for 2022 already came in. It was, I think, 60.9% as uh, reported by our president. Um, uh, Dr. Uh, um, Arbeta. Um, remember also that we were also the team that uh, forecasted debt to GDP ratio. And we actually forecasted debt, uh, the debt ratio to be around 63% this year. And it was 63% in the middle of the year. But we also emphasized that the uptick from pre pandemic to 2020, uh, six percentage points of that was actually due to government building up cash. So as we said, there was a 6% uh, leeway for, for our treasurer, for our for the national government. So yeah, so um, that's for the conditions going into uh, 2033. We now look at uh, the macro outlook. So ito na yon, tandadaan. Okay, so uh, what's our macro outlook? Um, can we flash our macro, macro outlook page? Okay, so I think this is everyone, what everyone is waiting for. So before I discuss why our macro outlook is like that, I first uh, would like to sort of report how we have performed uh, in the past in terms of forecasting. Um, so we usually forecast every October. Okay, so, um, so there's a slight information advantage versus the other institutions um, so um, um, so we forecast around October uh, and then we forecast for the year and for the next year okay so in 2020 October 2020 so we have the first half results in so we know the first half results so October 2020 or actually September 2020 is when we start forecasting and uh, the forecasting method we use, I think this is important for those the technical people who are watching, we're using our FCI and we're following the Bernanke approach, uh, continuing again the paper uh, from what I did with, uh, in my paper with Dr. Uh, Bautista. And uh, we use that to forecast ahead. Okay, so for 2020, we forecasted minus 9.5. So first, Anayon, beginner's luck, it was actually minus 9.5. So we forecasted that around October, 2020. So the ones in parenthesis, our year forward forecast, meaning for 2021, the figures in parenthesis were forecasted in October, 2020. So in October, 2020, for 2021, for example, we forecasted 6%. Okay, and, every, and we were like in the middle because the most pessimistic then was World Bank, 5.3%. And then of course, government was 6.5 to 7.5%. And then the, the COVID continued, we had uh, Delta waves, et cetera. And so 
all the forecasts were brought down and they're brought down to around uh, four, between 45%. We brought it a little bit, uh, so na sobrahan. So we brought it down to 5.4% and the actual number was 5.7%. Okay, so again, in uh, the same thing for 2022, in October 2021, we forecasted GDP growth of 6.5% for 2022. So, um, so we were rather on the optimistic side. Government was in 7 to 9%. We were below government, but we were still optimistic, I think, at 65 along with the private sector. Um, and then again, uh, there was a continuous stream of information, and we saw that the numbers were surprising on the high side. And so we pushed it up to 7.1%, um, thinking that you know inflation will somehow temper the number. But again, the revival story was very strong. Um, the reopening story was very strong. And of course, now looking back, uh, we should have known that it was because even our own lives, we've witnessed it. We did a lot of catch, catch up spending uh, when the economy is reopened. And so the actual was 7.6%. So still not a bad forecast. Um, so for this year, for the coming year, we are penciling in uh, between 4.5 to 5.5 percent. Okay, so this is uh, lower uh, than government. I'll explain why it's lower based on my conversations with government people, uh, forecasters from government. So they're forecasting 6.5 to 8 percent. We're forecasting 4.5 to 5% based on the, the threads I, I talked about earlier, the themes I talked about earlier. Um, basically, the external headwinds and, and the inflation story, uh, et cetera. And then, uh, so we're sort of now on the pessimistic end. Uh, we're about the same as with the IMF uh, and the World Bank, uh, maybe lower than the World Bank. Uh, on the optimistic end, it's the government and ADB uh, and uh, um, the private sector. Focused economics, by the way, is the private sector average. They're around 5.7%. Now, the reason why we have a lower uh, than government, because when I talked to the forecasters of government, they said they were penciling in investment, um, investment surge, uh, which they anticipate because of the CREATE law and the lowering uh, of the taxes, which uh, should invite in investment. Okay, so that's ma mainly where we differ, I think. So next slide, please. For inflation, for inflation, um, again, same story. Uh, we did quite well, 2020, 2021. So 2.6% 2 forecast versus 2.6 actual. This is prior to rebasing. I'm bringing it back to bringing it back to prior rebasing, because that's how that's the series that we use in forecasting. So that eventually became 2.4 percent, I think. So depending on, on which index you use, either we're we're not the ones who are correct, or we are the ones uh, that are correct. For 2021, uh, again, not bad. Uh, 2022, not bad. So this year, uh, I guess this is the number people would like to know. We have penciled in 3.5 to 4.5%, but we do have to say that uh, it, we may revise it uh, depending on what happens in the next of, of the following months. Uh, okay, but the 8.6% in January is already a sign of where the headline inflation is going to land by the end of the year because the way we measure it is really a year on year year and it's a yearly average. Okay, so um, next slide, please. So what are the limiting factors, uh, risks and challenges? So I'll just go this quick uh, through this quickly. Um, the one is high inflation. So higher consumer prices have reduced the purchasing power of households while higher input costs are pressuring businesses, especially those with, with already thin margins and low net worth. And this may continue to dampen private consumption and investment appetite. We are also looking at the business environment, which has become more challenging due to higher financing and business costs and economic uncertainty. Businesses are still recovering from the pandemic and may be more cautious given a new political leadership. 
and recent reforms to liberalize investment may take time to bear fruit. The final limiting factor is the policy space to counter an economic slowdown. The central bank is constrained to keep monetary policy tight to fight inflation. Meanwhile, the rise in deficits and public debt due to the, to the pandemic has pressed the government to pursue fiscal consolidation. Next slide, please. So there are a number of risks. Um, so um, there's some might say there's no such thing as an upside risk. So I'll change that to upside potential because risk now is something that you anticipate that is not wanted. So we talk about upside potentials and downside risks. The upside is there is an upside, so we're not all negative. And there's actually potential for a strong upside, especially if what the government forecasters are anticipating will happen is if inv investments come in. Another upside is the still resilient remittances. Okay, so most of the forecasters in government and in the private sector always look at this. And we always try to find hope in it because in the global financial crisis, remittances managed to stay strong despite the global downturn. So that is what we are hoping for, resilient remittances and resilient BPO receipts. Okay, uh, BPO receipts may remain strong. By the way, um, remittances may remain, remain strong because of the demand for health care workers because of the pandemic also. And BPO receipts similarly may remain strong in a post-pandemic world given the need for digital workers. Okay, so those are the positive um, things that we uh, hope will happen. And of course, there's the possible revival of tourism. So why are we looking at tourism? Um, so mainly because we're ha only just halfway from where we were before. Prior to pandemic, we were around at 800,000 tour tourist arrivals. 800,000 by uh, in December 2019. Last December, it was only 400,000 thereabouts. Okay, so a lot of space. And if China is, you know, opening up and other countries are opening up, then there is a, an upside there um for uh, for the private sector the other upside is the uh, um commodity prices have actually started to decline so that's an upside uh the downside uh i don't want to reiterate but they have to but there's the drop in global financial conditions possible recession still in the us maybe no longer in china um and then there's uh the continuing conflict that hopefully will end between Russia and Ukraine. Next slide, please. And um, so finally, um, the last thing that, uh, and most important thing, uh, the biggest challenge of the government is economic scarring from pandemic. So I am like already a broken record. I keep talking about this in every article I write. It's really the economic scarring that we have to reverse. Many sectors of the economy have suffered enduring business uh, losses, human capital losses due to closures of firms and the unemployment uh, during the lockdowns and restrictions, the mobility restrictions. So output in some sectors are still below pre-pandemic levels. I think that is one thing uh, we are very worried about. There must be new areas of growth to help bring the economy to its pre-pandemic path. If you look at the first graph, um, the scarring, the, the visual representation of that is if you imagine a line protruding from where growth, uh, where GDP was, uh, GDP was in 2019. So if you imagine a line there, that is where we should have been if the COVID-19 had not happened. And so the crater that is created, if you imagine that line and the uka, the crater, the uka in the graph, that is the representation of the scarring, uh, which suggests that there may have been diminution of capital, both business and human capital, that has to be addressed. In the industrial sector, industrial sector, you can see that in construction, you can see that in manufacturing, in the services sector, which is the most affected by the pandemic, it's most obvious in uh, accommodation and food, very obvious also in transportation and storage, uh, also in real estate, et cetera. So these, these things, uh, uh, growth has to come from, from new areas in order for, 
for uh, the economy to, to be propelled into a higher growth path. So um, for the last part, uh, we just like to reiterate some of the policy priorities. We think some of the things gov we think government should prioritize. Okay, so this is really just a reminder that there ought to be uh, good uh, government, uh, uh, ought to be good macro management. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, policy priorities and proposals. So um, one is really a reminder for good uh, macro management. Um, so continued good macro management. Sorry if I'm if I if I'm, I might get misunderstood, but it's really just continued uh, good uh, macro management. Uh, one is to control inflation without harming growth. So inflation must be controlled as it creates instability and worsens poverty. But this should, this should be done without stifling the recovery. So again, carefully calibrated responses and a coherent public communication strategy. Higher, we suggest higher frequency surveys on household and business expectations, which can help with early de detection of inflation risk. So the BSP has done a very good job already on that. And, and we look forward to, uh, to more monitoring um, to help cushion the effects of inflation on poor households. Um, we hope there would be targeted support for these households rather than price controls or untargeted subsidies. By the way, these, this was written again in October of 2022. So much of this has already been addressed, um, but uh, still we would like to reiterate. So another, aside from the demand side uh, um, correction to inflation, uh, we also encourage looking at the supply side, which again is being done by government uh, today, and uh, looking at reforms that could raise productivity to lower inflation in the long run, investment in education, in infrastructure, in the more media, uh, immediate term, uh, removal of supply cons constraints that may be adding to inflation or fueling in in inflation, uh, such as easing import restrictions when needed. So again, we have the various EOs addressing um, pork, rice, uh, extend, extended to um, ta uh, tariffs on imported cord and coal, et cetera. So all these measures that temporarily uh, are um, um, reducing the tariffs to mitigate the inflation pressures. Next slide, please. Another uh, thing we would like just to um, highlight is uh, smoothening of exchange rate volatility because sharp depreciation may make the fight against inflation more difficult. It may harm balance sheets of firms and it heightens business uncertainty. However, we also remind, try, want to sort of reiterate that policy responses should also depend on the nature of the exchange rate movement. If depreciation is because of fundamental factors and financial markets are stable, then once, uh, one simply has to adjust monetary policy to keep within inflation targets and allow the exchange rate to serve its purpose as an automatic shock absorber. However, uh, temporary exchange rate interventions may be warranted when the market disturbances uh, are in danger of triggering financial or macroeconomic stability. Okay, so that's again, um, just a helpful reminder. Um, Next slide, please. Um, we also um, would just like to reiterate the reminder to pursue fiscal sustainability while keeping um, being mindful of what is happening to the vulnerable sectors of society. So pursuing fiscal sustainability, but protecting those at risk. So while fiscal space must be rebuilt, the government should protect those suffering from elevated inflation and the pandemic's lingering effects. Targeted, again, support to poor households can provide relief without undermining fiscal targets. To foster credibility, the medium-term medium -term fiscal framework should provide specifics on public spending prioritization, future legislative, legislative measures in terms of size and sufficiency of new revenue sources, and most especially the timing of these um, fiscal reforms. Um, another reminder, the Mandana's Garcia ruling has added uncertainty to the government's spending plans. So we again call for greater clarity on policy implementation 
before moving ahead with full devolution. Again, this was written in October of 2022, and it has been address, addressed. And actually, uh, the time allotted for the devolution has already been extended uh, from 2024 to 2027 to give our local governments more time uh, for the change, uh, to adjust to the change. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then there's also, given the external headwinds, there's a need to prepare for financial tightening and uncertainty. These are the things that we tend to forget, but it's useful to remind because with global financial tightening, uh, spillovers to emerging markets are likely, and the Philippines is one uh, emerging market, and this can multiply financial risks. So again, just a call for our regulators to stay vigilant of threats to financial stability through close monitoring of banks. And actually, all the indicators are okay uh, just yet uh, today. I think we saw NPLs go uh, reported going down and capital adequacy indicators remaining high and comfortable at comfortable levels. But there's also, uh, going beyond banks, there should also be monitoring of conglomerates that are associated with banks, including offshore and foreign currency borrowing of non-financial firms. Uh, we raised this, this has been raised by the World Bank, mentioning the Philippines as being among the vulnerable to exchange rate depreciations with at least uh, three fifths of maturing debt uh, consisting of syndicated loans and bonds denominated in foreign currency. Okay, so just a helpful reminder on that. To preserve financial stability, the central bank could consider using its powers to gather information from broad sectors and close, therefore close important data gaps. Okay, the financial regulators have already embraced a macro prudential framework. So we, uh, we cheered that effort. So we encourage that there be continued monitoring of financial risk from a macro prudential perspective, for instance, through some sort of macro scenario stress test. Okay, so that's something that we are looking forward to seeing uh, being done by our uh, regulators. Next slide, please. So, um, so this is the second la to the last uh, recommendation. And this is again, our broken record theme, which is really uh, address the pandemic star scars. It cannot be uh, overstated that the productivity losses from the COVID-19 crisis has to be reversed. Uh, one immediate way uh, to do this is just to continue uh, prioritization of infrastructure spending because this helps address scarring by enhancing physical capital of uh, the country. It, uh, of course, boosts long-term growth, while at the same time also boosting short-term growth through the short-run multiplier effects. So high potential areas include infrastructure for more efficient trade, better digital connectivity, and clean energy, especially where private sector participation is viable, with a caveat that financial risk to government remain carefully controlled. And again, the government should also continue human capital investments in education, learning losses during the pandemic, very deep. I mean, in our households, those of us who are mothers, we know exactly what this means uh, because for how many years we had to live with online learning and we know that's not enough. And so there has to be some way, especially among public schools, to reverse those losses. And there's, we saw how the need, the importance of efficient social protection delivery. So again, continued efforts on that. We've already started to digitize that. So we should go on with that. And continued investment in public health care. And again, the reason is obvious because we do not want to go to an, through another uh, COVID-19 pandemic type regime again, uh, where we had to, uh, uh, to lock down the economy. Uh, just to uh, keep going. Okay, so lastly, and I think this is where I think we we also place full emphasis on, there should be continued policy uh, and momentum on investments. So I'm very glad that we now have I'm now using the past tense rather than the present tense with one of the strict strictest sorry regulatory regimes. For, the, uh, for foreign direct investment in Southeast Asia, the Philippines had 
perennially lagged its neighbors in attracting FDI. And I'm using had because there's good news. There's a fortunately here. Fortunately, the past administration has left us with laws that have loosened long-standing restrictions to the FDI, boosting the, boosting the country's investment competitiveness. Okay, so we know these laws, these are the amendment of the Retail Trade Act of 2000. Uh, so we have relaxed restrictions on foreign participation in the retail trade area sector. Then there's uh, the amendment of the 1991 Foreign Investment Act. The RA numbers are on the slide. So this allows for greater foreign participation in micro and small scale enterprises. And then finally, uh, the most important, of, um, the more important, uh, well, I, let's not rank it. One of the important reforms was the amendment of the Public Service Act of 1936, which enables uh, full foreign ownership in public services that are not public utilities or critical uh, infrastructure. Okay, so the government uh, should continue to remove impediments to FDI. And the usual complaint list that they have to address, it's been there and it's uh, you know written down in the in the, in the websites of the foreign in, uh, investment uh, um, uh, related to foreign investment. And these include inadequate infrastructure, expensive power, slow internet connectivity, regulatory inconsistencies, and concerns about government corruption. In a latest in the in the latest uh, CEO survey, there was uh, they had a survey on what they think are the top risks uh, to a recovery, and they highlighted corruption as one of them. And so I guess that is where um, some uh, the effort should be focused on. So summing up, macro outlook in 2023, steering through global headwinds in uh, 2023. This has been challenging. This going to be challenging times for the Philippine economy and the rest of the world. Economic growth in the Philippines will likely moderate, but there are positive surprises that are possible. So let's not lose hope. There's remittances, there's tourism, there's BPOs, and hopefully a lot more. Um, we have to live with inflation through the year. It may be elevated, uh, mainly because of the um, we're dealing with year-on-year -year inflation and January was already high, so likely to be high until the middle of the year. So we can expect inflation to fall, hopefully by the middle of the year. Okay, so policy recommendations just continue pers uh, to pursue balanced macro management. I hope our man econ economic managers keep their eye on the ball. I think that's my message. Keep the eye on the ball, uh, really um, stable management, that is what we, we should be uh, concentrating on now. Um, and then address the pandemic scars. Also another uh, thing we should be placer focused on, drop everything else and manage the economy well, and then continue policy uh, momentum on investments, particularly FDI. Okay, thank you very much for listening. That was a, a very hard presentation to make. And yeah, thank you.